It is Monday, it is 1 p.m. Yes, this is Pospo and Braincast for Motivate Learning. I have to say, I'm impressed. You still show up here. Personally, you know, I have a bit of, you know, Teams, Zoom, and all things virtual fatigue. You know, I just want to go to a room and talk to people. But then again, that would have meant that we wouldn't be able to talk to all these, you know, amazing scientists from all around the world. I mean, who would have paid for my plane ticket to Montreal to talk with Professor Gustavo Turecki, one of the leading figures in the biological research of suicide? Only thing I had to do was send him an email and switch my microphone and my camera on. Or this week, who would have paid for my plane ticket to Boston, as this is where we find today's guest? He's a professor of psychiatry at the Tufts University School of Medicine, and I have to say that this didn't really come easy. You know, he went to Yale University, he, uh, he went to Tufts University, but also had a DuPont Warren Research Fellowship at the Harvard Medical School. He's a distinguished life fellow of the American Psychiatric Association and a past president and distinguished life fellow of the Association for Academic Psychiatry. He has even trained in psychoanalysis. He has written numerous publications in scientific journals, book chapters and whole books, but today he's here, or we're hoping that he's going to be here, uh, to talk about medication, one specific medication, not just any medication. He's going to talk about benzodiazepines. There is a sign of a microphone, so maybe he's going to be able to join How us. About yes, we nailed it. Can you hear me? Yes, I okay. can hear and see you. This on the, on the fourth time it worked. Prof, this is this is amazing. This I love. You know, I'm Greek, so I love drama. Uh, so yeah, we oh made. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. So, Prof, I already introduced you, so and people have been patiently waiting for you. Uh, so, Thank you. let's crack on. So, welcome to Braincast, and let's start with the basics. So, can okay. you tell us just a bit about benzodiazepines? So, how were they discovered? But most right. importantly, how and where do they exert their action? Right. So uh, this was discovered by a biochemist named Leo Sternbach, who was working uh, in the U.S. for uh, Hoffman, Hoffman LaRoche Pharmaceuticals. And the idea was that um, trying to find something that would replace barbiturates for treatment of anxiety. Um, there had already been meprobamate marketed as Milltown which was very popular. And the company was trying to push Sternbach to find something that would have very similar actions, but could be patented separately. And so uh, in about 1955, he discovered chlordiazepoxide, which was the first marketed benzodiazepine. Uh, and it was marketed in 1961. Shortly thereafter, diazepam was developed uh, and then in the 1970s, um, high potency, a couple of high potency benzodiazepines, uh, lorazepam and clonazepam were developed. Uh, these medications are, are GABAergic drugs. They, they essentially sensitize chloride channels to the effects of GABA. And GABAergic drugs are the most uh, common uh, synaptic transmitters in the brain, they are, they've been estimated to be present in about 30% of, of neurons. And they are, their interneurons spread very widely throughout the cortex and the limbic system, not the reticular activating system, uh, which you, which you might assume, but it isn't. Um, the, one benefit of the benzodiazepines over barbiturates is that they, the drugs themselves do not open the chloride ion channels. They just make it easier for GABA to do so. And the result of that is that they're much less dangerous in overdose than uh, barbiturates were. Um, it's more recently been publicized that after uh, the benzodiazepines were invented and 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 uh, approved, they were 
marketed in the early days by none other than Arthur Sackler, whose family went on to uh, now become notorious uh, as the owners of Purdue Pharma, which distributed and marketed oxycodone. And so, uh, unfortunately, from the very beginning, the benzodiazepines had a sort of inadvertent um, association with opioids. Uh, that this seems to have been their fate. And, and, and Prof, you know, whilst their main action, as you've alluded to a bit uh, through the uh, the effect on the on the GABA system, it's yes. a calming you want sometimes even sedative effects, benzodiazepines are also known to have a what's more widely known as a, as a paradoxical reaction. So wh what is this paradoxical reaction and who is at risk of developing one? Yeah, the I have to say the paradoxical reaction is something that is much more talked about than, than actually seen. Uh, I, I've, I, I've spent much of my career attending on inpatient services the nursing staff inevitably brings it up as a worry. I've literally never seen a single person who had a paradoxical reaction to benzodiazepines. The, the literature is not uh, wonderful, but such as there is, and it's largely it's case series and case reports, the people who are most likely to have this reaction, and, and just to define it, it's instead of being, um, calmed or sedated, uh, and in a very early um, marketing ploy by, by Sackler, uh, there was in Life magazine a picture of a tiger in a zoo that had been made tame by administration of chlordiazepoxide. Well, the paradoxical reaction is the opposite, that people become disinhibited or even, in theory, aggressive. The people who are most likely to have this happen are very young young children, elderly okay. people, uh, people who have a coarse brain pathology of one kind or another, uh, pe people with a cognitive impairment, people, for example, with, um, with uh, developmental learning disorders, and people, um, people who have a history of impulsive aggressive behavior um, yes. even without the benzodiazepine so if you think about you know anxiety what anxiety does it's a danger signal and so most of the time when there's a danger signal people slow down and they they freeze they're more likely to be inhibited in their behavior uh, and when you take away anxiety, uh, there is a degree of disinhib disinhibition in people who are prone to it. So the, the reported rates of this paradoxical reaction vary widely, but in populations that don't include any of these people, uh, it's estimated to be less than 1%. Also, it's much more likely to happen with intravenous, um, administration than with oral administration, and of course with high potency uh, yeah. benzodiazepines. That's really helpful. And, and, and you know, although mainly linked, mainly linked with psychiatry, the truth is that benzodiazepines have a wide range of indications from restless leg syndrome, catatonia, uh, but also epilepsy. So what are the most common uh, indications and and since we're going to talk about indications of course this you know this implies that there are also contraindications and in fact you know the the american geriatric association for example advises against the use of benzodiazepines in the elderly based on evidence suggesting that benzos may bring on cognitive deficits and increase the risk of falls and hip fractures so could uh, which ones are the indications and the contraindications for benzodiazepines. Right. <clears throat> okay, so we'll start with the indications. Um, I suppose the simpler ones are the non-psychiatric indications because there really aren't very many of them. Uh, it's, it's mainly, there is some use in anesthesia, mostly in conscious sedation. Sometimes yeah. with anesthesia itself, for example, 
uh, sometimes people come out of anesthesia in an agitated state and midazolam, for example, can be very useful in, in dealing with that. Um, muscle relaxation is a, is a main indication. And um, they also are used to uh, terminate a seizure acutely, for example, uh, intravenous uh, diazepam or lorazepam, they really are not used as maintenance medications for seizures because tolerance does develop to the uh, anti-epileptic actions. Now, within psychiatry, the main and most common indication is for the variety of anxiety disorders. There's, there is literature supporting their use in generalized anxiety disorder, in um, panic disorder, in social anxiety disorder. Um, catatonia, of course, they are first line treatment in high doses for catatonia. They are also uh, used, of course, in uh, treatment of delirium tremens and in alcohol detox generally. And they can be very useful adjunctively, certainly not as, as um, medications, uh, sole medications, in treating um, people with either affective or schizophrenia spectrum psychoses who have a degree of agitation uh, mm. as part of their uh, presenting picture. Um, so, so that's the range. In terms of, just to put it into perspective a little bit, um, in general, such studies as there are, and there aren't very many direct head-to-head -head comparisons, there's a little bit more indirect literature, suggests that benzodiazepines are at least and maybe somewhat more effective for treatment of anxiety disorders than uh, antidepressant medications, um, uh, particularly for panic disorder. Um, and particularly for the more somatic uh, manifestations of anxiety disorders. Now, in terms of contraindications or, or liabilities, benzodiazepines absolutely have liabilities, and they are more of concern in some people than in others. So the main yeah. things yeah. are um, a degree of cognitive impairment, um, particularly uh, um, recent learning, non-verbal verbal learning, speed of processing, that's an issue. Um, another issue is um, coordination. Uh, they may impair coordination and therefore uh, be of greater risk for, for falls um, in people who are prone to falls. Um, Again, to put this into perspective, there, there have been recent reviews. There was a review in 2019 by Qualiato of side effects compared to uh, antidepressants. And surprisingly, um, benzodiazepines appeared to have less cognitive impairment in their review of the literature than antidepressants. Antidepressants actually have a substantial amount of cognitive interference. Um, another review by Walcott in 2009 found that benzodiazepines, antidepressants, and antipsychotic medications were roughly equivalent in their tendency to um, produce falls in the elderly. That mm -hmm. said, um, Contraindications, there are mostly relative contraindications to benzodiazepines. I would say absolute contraindications certainly would be people who uh, are abuse, actively abusing substances, people who haven't done well on benzodiazepines in the past. Relative contra contraindications, certainly in the elderly, uh, you, you would be I much see, more reluctant to prescribe them. Mm -hmm. In anybody with cognitive impairment, coarse brain pathology, delirium, uh, similarly, you'd, you'd have to be very and, careful. And, 
and, and Prof, since you started, you know, citing papers, you know, according to a 2016 American Journal of Public Health paper by uh, Bach Huber, the number of benzodiazepine prescriptions not only increased 67% from the mid 90s to it was 2013 or something, but the quantity also increased more than threefold over this time period, which, to be honest, is a bit concerning. It's one of the biggest headaches, you know, for any prescriber around the world, is that it is extremely common for benzodiazepines to also be misused. So, excluding people with an established substance abuse concern, uh, that you know, as we know, the FDA also issued a black box warning about the concomitant use of benzos and opioids. Who else is more prone, you think? to misuse benzodiazepines and potentially even become dependent on them. So this is a big subject and and we I think it's very important to be as precise as we can in using what the words mean that we use. So okay. misuse is defined as any use that is different from as a doctor is prescribing and that can be taking more than uh, than is prescribed can be taking less than is prescribed. And there are some research studies that, that suggest that the majority of, of patients who are prescribed benzodiazepines for anxiety actually take less than are prescribed, not more. Mm -hmm. um, that's different from abuse. Abuse is taking a medication essentially to get high. Another and it certainly is different from addiction, which is a syndrome in which people take a medication to get high and they mm -hmm. become preoccupied with it and they have cravings and they persist in use of the medication in the face of adverse consequences. So those are three very different things. Uh, the, there is a literature on misuse of benzodiazepines. Um, and uh, there have been a couple, excuse me. There, Don't pick there that up. Don't pick that up. Recent, <laughs> a couple of recent studies that show that maybe 17% of patients prescribed benzodiazepines tend to misuse them, which is a high number. But what these studies show is that a minuscule proportion of those people are using them to get high. They are mostly using them or trying to use them for relief of symptoms. Uh, there was a, a review by Maust recently, another review by Votaw. They, they say the same thing. The, that literature has always said the same thing. So these are people who are trying to relieve distress. And so why are they taking medications in a way that's uh, not what the prescriber uh, has advised them to do. I think that there are many factors in this. There is, I, I, be, there, I believe there's a large prescriber factor. There's also a patient factor. The prescriber factor is that very often people prescribing benzodiazepines, in, in my opinion, don't prescribe optimally. First of all, it's very important to be clear with the patient what the medications can do, what the targets are, and what they cannot do. With the exception of panic, panic attacks, which really should be completely eliminated by medication, there's no medication that completely gets rid of somebody's anxiety, nor should there be, because anxiety is a human emotion. Uh, most of the time, the medication can only bring it down to the level where it's not overwhelming, and the, the person then needs to use non-medical ways of dealing with anxiety, dealing with uh, avoidance. Um, so that's number one. So the, yeah. the expectations has to be realistic. Number two, the prescriber has to prescribe adequately and confidently, not with suspicion that he's going to turn the patient into a drug addict for which there is absolutely no indication in the literature at all. There is no evidence that I've seen or that anybody has quoted to me that benzodiazepines are gateway drugs to other medications of, of abuse or that they are abused as sole drugs of abuse themselves. Thirdly, so 
the prescription has to be adequate. It also works much better as a standing prescription. There's a common misconception that if you, it's somehow more conservative or safer if you prescribe PRN. It's exactly the opposite. If you prescribe PRN, you are focusing the patient on his or her anxiety. And the patient is always walking around taking their own temperature. Do I feel bad enough yet to take this medicine? And once mm -hmm. they do, of course, it doesn't work right away. It takes a while to work. Meantime, the patient gets even more anxious and thinks, oh, this stuff isn't working. Maybe they take an extra dose out of a sort of a panicky feeling. And then the whole thing goes down the drain because the doctor says, oh, patient, patient, patient is taking more. They're getting hooked. I knew I shouldn't have prescribed this stuff. And so there's a lot of mischief, I think, that is created by this scenario. Then there's the patient factor. The patient factor, I think, is you have to be very careful not to prescribe benzodiazepines for people who are not really looking for anxiety relief, they're looking for anesthesia. These are people who cannot tolerate negative affects very well. And they're really hoping to wipe out their negative affects. <clears throat> and these people, uh, are not taking the medication to get high either, uh, but they will be misusing it and they'll be taking more than makes any sense. And in my experience, these are not good people to take benzodiazepines at all because it's too tempting for them to misuse. Um, I, I will also say that it is, benzodiazepines really don't cause a high. Uh, they, it's very difficult to get animals to self-administer benzodiazepines. People with no history of substance abuse who are blindly administered benzodiazepines cannot distinguish them from placebos. And you can, you can do some manipulations to change that, but it is a very, very different reinforcement pattern than mm. opioids, alcohol, cocaine, or for that matter, sugar uh, in animal experiments. But, but Prof, on, on the other hand, you know, I, I, hear, I hear you say these things, but at the same time, you know, it's well known that benzodiazepines can be notoriously difficult uh, to stop. And it's not uncommon, you know, for people to complain, you know, of, of withdrawal symptoms. And, you know, I hear you talking about you know, the, the amount and the length of the prescription. And the truth is that at least here in the UK, you know, the British National Formulary recommends that uninterrupted usage should not exceed four weeks, which is also yep. reflected in the, in the multi prescribing guidelines. Yep. And so this is not reflected in the reality though, as a 2017 paper at British Journal of General Practice suggests that a quarter of a million people in England are likely yep. to be taking benzodiazepines far beyond the recommended time frame of the four weeks. So, yep. and things, but up to an extent, from what I'm hearing you say, you may disagree. And for people not familiar, you know, a few months earlier, you published a paper at the British Journal of Psychiatry titled Benzodiazepines. It's time to return to the evidence. So I would like to hear a bit more. So what are you suggesting? Yeah, so uh, you are absolutely right. The guide, practice guidelines almost inevitably say that, uh, but there's no evidence to support it. There is absolutely no evidence to support it. For example, uh, one uh, assumption that these guidelines are based on is that people tend to escalate their dose, that there's tolerance to the anxiolytic effects of benzodiazepines. In fact, there's not the slightest evidence. All the evidence that exists says the opposite, including long-term follow-up studies, uh, naturalistic. There's only one um, uh, random controlled study uh, by Nardi that I know of, but that shows the same thing. Tolerance exists to the sedating effects of benzodiazepines, to the coordination effects, to the anti-epileptic effects, not to the anxiolytic effects. Um, so that's one issue. The second issue is that the, although there is unquestionably a withdrawal or discontinuation syndrome of benzodiazepines, and it basically looks like 
the anxiety you're trying to treat, but more so, uh, more intense. And that can include both intense anxiety, insomnia, all kinds of somatic symptoms, heightened acuity to sounds and, and light. In an extreme case, although it's rare, even seizures. Um, however, um, people who have looked comparatively at withdrawal syndromes from antidepressants, particularly some of the SNRIs, venlafaxine is notoriously difficult to get off. And nobody says that about venlafaxine. Um, in general, the withdrawal is not nearly as severe as it's made out to be. The, with, <clears throat> the literature on withdrawal is a mess. It is, in my estimation, almost entirely inadequate because it says almost nothing about the original indications for which the medication was prescribed. So the mm. population is not defined, nor does it talk about the situation in which the benzodiazepines are being withdrawn. Uh, if you read Heather Ashton, she talks about this. Um, she, she spells this out very nicely in one of her publications. Um, and so it's very, very difficult to make any sense of this literature because if you assume that people who are um, on taking benzodiazepines chronically are dependent. What does dependent mean? It's a word with inevitably pejorative connotations in people's mind. I have a dependency. You're looking right at it. I'm dependent on eyeglasses. Um, and if somebody told me I better stop wearing the damn things, it wouldn't go very well. And so it's very difficult to differ differentiate what is return of the underlying anxiety syndrome that you're trying to treat and what is a withdrawal syndrome? <clears throat> Carl uh, Rickles I mean, is asking, I, hmm? go, go ahead, sorry. No, no, I, I, what, what I want to say is that, you know, uh, on up to an extent it makes sense, but I'm, I'm pretty confident that, you know, many people uh, you know, will disagree. I mean, essentially, you know, when I posted on my Twitter that we will be discussing about benzodiazepines, I'm telling you my feed went busier than the time I said I became a father. So lots of strong views that we yeah. can certainly not ignore, as the significant majority are from people with lived experience. And to be honest, you know, I was genuinely sad to hear tweets from people saying, you know, uh, how their lives were ruined by benzodiazepines. Yeah. On the other hand, of course, there were many comments from people saying that, you know, okay, not that many, but there were some patients saying that, in fact, benzodiazepines helped them. And certainly we cannot ignore that. And I have to say, in my clinical practice, uh, here in liaison psychiatry, uh, we tend to use benzodiazepines as well. So is there any way to predict how patients will respond? And essentially, right. uh, to make sure that, uh, they won't experience, you know, yeah. these withdrawal symptoms, or yeah. if they will experience them, uh, what can we do to make it be as easy as possible to stop them? Right. So let me let me start with the second question first, and then I'll answer also the first question. The second question uh, has to do with how we taper things, and there are two things about tapers. It is not just the speed of tapers. There's no question that we need slow tapers in many of these cases. But it isn't just that we need slow tapers, we need unpressured and flexible tapers. Uh, flexible means that you put the control in the hands of the patient and you say to the patient, here is, here is a starting withdrawal schedule. Don't go down to the next step until you feel comfortable where you are. Mm. I have never had trouble getting anybody down or off benzodiazepines on that kind of a protocol. You have to understand you're treating anxiety disorder patients. These are very mm. anxious people and they have a preoccupation with control. And the worst thing is to take control out of their hands because that makes them more anxious and more prone to any sort of 
a somatic symptom that's troubling them. Also, it's important to remember that the taper effect is not linear, it's logarithmic, meaning that, uh, that what your body senses is not the absolute decrement in the dose, it's the proportional decrement in the dose. So that toward the end of the taper, you have to, you have to find ways to decrease the dose by smaller amounts because the proportion of change gets bigger. That I think is not appreciated by a lot of people who are trying to, to taper people off benzodiazepines. I tell my patients, there's no hurry. It's not an emergency. This can take as much time as you want. Now, the, the first question is something that we need to understand as a field much, much better than we do. I think we have <laughs> close to zero understanding of it. There mm. unquestionably are people who are exquisitely sensitive to benzodiazepines and have an unusually difficult time getting off them. I have two patients right now in my practice like that. One of them has never even been a psychiatric patient. She was prescribed benzodiazepines as muscle relaxants following <clears throat> musculoskeletal injury in an automobile accident. And she practically, she was referred to me for help tapering down. She practically has to use a microtome to shave off a, a wow. tiny piece of her diazepam. She's determined to do it. She's made huge progress, but she is amazingly sensitive. The second patient, she's in her 60s. The second patient is a little older in her 70s. She was first prescribed benzodiazepines as sleeping medications. And she has the same sensitivity to SSRIs as to benzodiazepines. She has the devil of a time getting off either one. I, I didn't I prescribe either of those medicines. She also came to me and I wound up saying to her, look, um, you're not in an age category where we like to see people taking benzodiazepines, but you don't have symptoms. You're not complaining of memory troubles. You're not having falls. Your coordination is fine. Just stay on the medicines uh, bec because your life will be miserable. So we, I don't think we know how to identify these people. There probably are people who, uh, who have personality pathology that is involved in this, bad prescribing experiences and unreasonable expectations are involved in this. I think we really just don't know and we need to know much more about this. I mean, I mean it's interesting that, you know, uh, one of your comments, because there was a 2020 paper in Therapeutic Advances in Psychopharmacology last September, uh, so it was a paper by Anne Guy titled The Patient Voice. And essentially what patients feel uh, and say uh, in this survey is that uh, this is for antidepressants, of course, it's not for benzodiazepines, but I sense that there may be something similar. That whenever they say to the doctors that, you know what, I have withdrawal symptoms, they're often dismissed uh, or misdiagnosed with other a relapse uh, or uh, a new medical condition. And this is certainly something that, you know, we need to work better on uh, to work, you know, with our patients. Prof, I'm really thankful for your time. We ran out of time. Actually, we're already late, uh, but thank you so much. We made it in the end. Uh, nobody we believed did. that we're going to make it. <laughs> we did, Thanks, we did. Prof. Thanks so, for the opportunity to talk so about this. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Prof. Professor Edward Silverman on benzodiazepines. Next week is a bank holiday here in the UK, so we will be taking a break, but we will be making a huge comeback in June for the last few sessions of Braincast before we allow ourselves to melt all the way under the sun. So June 14, I will be meeting Dr. Marija Kundakovic all the way from New York City to discuss the female brain. But first, join me June 7 as I will be flying to Edinburgh to meet the undeniable leaders worldwide when it comes to functional neurological disorders. Professors John Stone and Alan Carson. Until then, POSPO and Braincast for most of the learning over and out.